and good morning, everyone, and thank you for the invitation to talk to you about this. Um, I want to describe uh, something about Jung's approach to psychosis and show how it might be relevant to uh, what's going on in mental health care today. Um, Jung had a very specific approach to extreme states of psychological fragmentation that we call psychosis or schizophrenia. And in order to understand his approach, um, I, I want to show you a, quickly a diagram of his model of the psyche. Um, and I'm so I'm going to try to sh share my screen, if you'll allow me to. Um, I, I hope you can see this um, diagram. Um, the, the diagram shows that in Jung's model, the psyche is somewhat like an iceberg. At the tip of the iceberg is everyday consciousness that we call ego consciousness, just meaning the ordinary everyday personality. And below that is material that the psychoanalysts call repressed material, material from childhood, which is forgotten, uh, pushed out of awareness because it was so painful, too painful to remember. And the move that Jung makes, which is controversial, is that below that, there's another level, a deeper level of the psyche that he calls the collective unconscious, the transpersonal unconscious. And this is the level that he thinks that mythic imagery, religious and mythic imagery arises from. This level of the psyche, this deep level, is the source of religious experience. It's the spiritual dimension of the psyche. And his idea, very briefly, is that material from this deep level, this mythic level of the psyche, rises up and floods the conscious personality who's undergoing one of these extreme states. That's the basic model. And I'm going to go into that in, uh, in, more, in more detail. Um, what Jung found was that all religions and all myth mythological systems have imagery of gods and goddesses and heavens and hells and imagery like a divine child, a virgin birth, the apocalypse, the eternal conflict of good and evil, messiahs, saviors, and so on. These themes are common to all religious traditions. And Jung thought that this, this kind of imagery comes from this deep level of the psyche, and he called that the archetypal level of the psyche. And he thought that that was an archaic level of the psyche, which still exists in the modern mind, but it's covered over by our rational mind. And what we call psychosis or, or illnesses like schizophrenia is actually an eruption of this mythic material into the field of the conscious personality, into what we call ego consciousness. And then what happens to the individual is that they become lost in this mythic world. And the people around them, of course, don't understand what's going on with that individual because this mythic imagery, this mythological imagery of gods and goddesses and so on, is very strange to people, those of us who are living in ordinary consensual reality. But actually, although this mythic material seems chaotic and disordered, actually, it has profound symbolic meaning. The problem is that the individual is lost in this flood of material and needs help coping with it. So Jung thought that what looks like an illness or a disorder is actually a natural healing process, working in its own way towards greater consciousness and renewal of the personality. So the, uh, from the outside, the process looks like disintegration. Actually, it's an attempt at reorganization and renewal of the personality. So briefly, treatment in the Jungian model is to allow the psyche, the mind, to proceed with its own processes. And what that needs is the correct responses from people caring for the person in this extreme state. And the way we do this is a process of, of empathy, attention, validation of this inner process, which manifests itself as an emotional crisis. But what the person needs is affirmation, exploration, understanding. If on the contrary, 
the, the surrounding labels the person, the person's material as meaningless and bizarre and sick, then the person shuts down. And if medication is given, then what ought to be a natural healing process is aborted. Now, the problem for therapy is that this mythopoetic or archetypal deep layer of the psyche is difficult to understand because this mythic imagery is fantastic and grotesque and often religious or otherworldly. It has these symbolic themes like death and rebirth and gods and devils and apocalyptic imagery like the end of the world. And, th and that's the material that surfaces during one of these episodes. But this kind of mythic material will, will annoy and puzzle the rational mind of the listener or the therapist, if the therapist has no knowledge of mythology and doesn't realize where this material is coming from, because from an ordinary point of view, this kind of material is irrational and it makes no sense from the point of view of ordinary reality. But that's the level of the psyche that has become prominent in, in states of mental fragmentation. So we can only understand this mythic imagery if we, if we have a knowledge of comparative mythology and religion, not just our own religion, but all world religions, and also ritual process becomes very important. So this symbolic mythological material that surfaces during psychosis is very meaningful if it can be understood. And this is the level that also emerges in dreams, which is why dreams sometimes can be very bizarre. So according to Jung, a psychotic state is rather like dreaming while one is awake. It's as if you're in a waking dream. Now, mythology is very important to psychotherapy because it expresses very profound emotions that sometimes can't be expressed using ordinary conceptual thought and language. So this intense mythic imagery expresses important emotional issues. Freud realized that when he tried to use the Oedipus myth to describe a certain psychological situation. Now, this is an early example of um, Jung's approach in his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. Um, and it's a story of uh, when he met with uh, a, a woman uh, called Marie-Louise von Franz, who was be to become a very important colleague of him, of his later on. She first came to see him as a very young student. And at that time, he described to her a catatonic girl, aged 18, who had a delusional inner life. In her delusion, she said she lived on the moon and where she was a savior and a redeemer. And she was trying to save the moon children from a winged vampire who kidnapped and killed women and children who were forced to live underground. So von Franz said to Jung, surely you mean that she thought she lived on the moon. This was delusional. But Jung insisted to von Franz, no, she lived on the moon. And so the, the young von Franz went away thinking that Jung might be crazy. But the point Jung was making was that subjectively, this woman's experience was true and real. And there was a redemptive intention in her fantasy. She'd been massively sexually abused and this severe trauma had fragmented her and she had withdrawn into catatonic isolation. But what Jung saw in her redemptive fantasy was an understanding of how the psyche tries to heal itself after unbearable trauma. The theme of the vampires is, of course, mythic imagery, and the vampire would symbolically represent those people who'd victimized her, who had drained her life energy and ex exploited her and so on. The point being that the psyche uses this kind of mythic imagery to express unbearable suffering. The, the intensity of what she gone through could only be expressed in terms of this graphic mythic imagery. Only that level of mythic imagery is intense enough to convey the intensity of what had happened to her. Now, in 1907, Jung wrote a book on the psychology of what was then called dementia prycox. And he pointed out here how the patient describes for us in her symptoms the hopes and disappointments of her life. 
he, he said that psychotic symptoms are symbolically expressing the person's situation using imagery that sounds delusional to us, but is actually mythic. So this is probably the first psychodynamic conceptualization of schizophrenia. It was very radical for its time because certainly in the early 20th century, this was a period in psychiatry when psychotic symptoms were seen as meaningless. But Jung suggested that the medical approach to the human mind, and here's a quote from him, the medical approach to the human mind is about as helpful as the approach of a mineralogist to the Chartres Cathedral. You know, in other words, you can't understand a great painting by trying to understand paint chemistry. It's it, the medical approach is 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 looking at the situation at the wrong level. The therapist has to ask, where is this process leading? What is this mythic imagery trying to express? So Jung said that in most cases, this is another quote, schizophrenic disturbances can be treated and cures by cured by psychological means. But this position that people with schizophrenia could be helped or cured with psychotherapy very much ran counter to the attitude that prevailed in psychiatry throughout the 20th century and still prominent today among many psychiatrists, despite notable contributions from psychoanalytic pioneers such as George Atwood. And here I'd like to quote from Atwood's excellent book, The Abyss of Madness, which I strongly recommend to you if you haven't seen it. Here's a quote from Atwood. Madness is not an illness and it's not a disorder. Madness is the abyss. It's the experience of utter annihilation, total fragmentation of the personality. Atwood points out that madness is called a disease localized in the brain because we are terrified of madness. When someone falls into the abyss, they need human understanding to help them back to survival. But as he says, an objectified psychiatric diagnosis is the antithesis of the needed validation and mirroring. Very much the same as what Jung had said 100 years before. And, Jung, and Atwood credits Jung for some of his, his ideas. He put, Atwood points out that delusions are like dreams. They are symbolic. They are metaphorical expressions of the person's psychological estate. And what they're trying to do, what they're trying to do is restore the individual and try to protect themselves from the sense of being annihilated. So just as an example of the metaphor of the delusion, if you have the delusion that you're dying, this is a metaphor for the sense that your limited state of being is coming to an end, or the death of the old personality is necessary, something like that. The, the delusion has to be understood in that metaphorical, symbolic sense. So if you, if you hear apocalyptic imagery about the end of the world, which is very common in many religions and mythology, uh, and people have delusions about the end of the world in a great apocalypse, that, that they are symbolically talking about their feeling of disintegration and the need for a radical personality change, the need for a new way to be in the world. So Jung realized that delusions that we see in psychosis are an attempt to compensate for a damaged sense of self and to express what's going on in the personality. And he insisted that the non-specific factors in psychotherapy, the, the personal relationship between patient and therapist are the critical factors in the treatment response. This is a quote from Jung. He said, in the treatment of psychosis, the thing that really matters is the personal commitment, the serious purpose, the devotion, the self-sacrifice of those who give the treatment. I have seen results that were truly miraculous as when sympathetic nurses and laymen were able by their courage and steady devotion to reestablish psychic rapport with their patients and so achieve quite astounding cures. So this attitude of his from 1907 is the basis of several attempts to treat people using psychosocial approaches. So I'd like to mention some of them to, that for people who are not aware of the history of this field, 
There are several historically important attempts have been made in this direction. One of the earliest was conducted by R.D. Lang in an institution run by the Maudsley Clinic in East London, known as Kingsley Hall in the early 1960s. Um, Lang viewed mental breakdowns as a healing process, as Jung did. And again, he saw them as part of a path to self-healing. In that institution, they didn't use any medication, even though many of the, their clients were experiencing full-blown psychotic episodes. Finally, it closed down, I think about 1964 or 5, and, and 65 of the psychotic people who'd been there were tracked down, but only nine had been re-hospitalized re since then. This is about a 15% recurrence rate, which is better than the recovery rate for serious mental illness found in most psychiatric centers today. Lang pointed out that people prone to psychosis were very sensitive people. They were able to perceive falseness and hidden feelings in the family about which the rest of the family is in denial. And so these very sensitive children were made to feel excluded and scapegoated. He believed that schizophrenia is a process that tries to escape an intolerable family situation. And he thought that the tendency to conceal painful experiences from ourselves is very marked in families where secrets are systematically hidden from one another. People in these families pretend and deny how they're feeling, or the family insists that the individual should experience the opposite of what he's actually feeling. And this causes a, a kind of mystification and confusion so that the child hardly knows, uh, uh, doesn't know what to believe. He doesn't know whether he can rely on his own perceptions and feelings. And that com compromises his sense of reality and that leads to psychotic withdrawal. So Lang pointed out that the most important aspect of therapy is for the therapist to be honest and straightforward, not using any particular technique. And then in this tradition, the Soteria approach was founded by Lauren Mosher in San Jose in 1971. And he again showed that people with acute psychosis can be treated with minimal antipsychotic medication. He treated people in a kind of home-like, very accepting environment with a focus on exploring the, the phenomenology of the individual. <clears throat> Excuse me. That project was closed in 1983 because of lack of finances. And of course, it was heavily criticized by the psychiatric establishment. But there are still similar places existing all over Europe. One of the, the ones I know about is in Bern in Switzerland. And then again, the same approach was used in a project in San Francisco called Diabasis by John Perry, which I'll come back to. Two months ago, I was in Brazil. I, I visited an institution in Rio de Janeiro called Casa das Palmeiras, founded 70 years ago by a woman called Nisa da, da Salveira a psychiatrist not very well known outside Brazil, but she also grounded her work uh, in Jung's approach. She went to Zurich and studied with him and then came back to Rio. And she also rebelled against the standard psychiatric treatment of her time. And she humanized the treatment of psychosis in Brazil. And in, I went to the building where she worked. It's still going. They focus on relationship, on, on empathy, understanding, and they use a lot of expressive modalities like art and sculpture and music and sewing and uh, also, they explore the therapeutic potential of animals as co-therapist. There's also a group in Palermo in Italy, which confirmed the idea that the most significant symptoms of acute psychosis are, make use of a kind of an encryption um, that you can decode if you understand the symbolic meaning of the person's language. So delusions, again, have symbolic or metaphoric meaning. And that to understand that language is a key element in, in, in understanding the person. In, in Palermo, they also use antipsychotic drugs only in very low doses just to contain the anxiety while they allow the psychotic process to continue. So those authors have, again, revised their understanding of psychosis from being a brain disease to being a process 
aimed at the rearrangement of psychic functioning along the lines of Jung, Jung's work. In Finland, there's a group called the Open Dialogue Research Group in North, Northern Finland, and they use the same methods. They use minimal amounts of neuroleptics, and they de define psychosis as a process that should be responded to as a meaningful life crisis. And they have remarkable first episode results. And in Northern Finland, as a result of that work, the, the rates and relapse rate of, of schizophrenia have gone down dramatically as a result of this open dialogue program. And here I also want to mention the work of Stan and Christina Groff on spiritual emergency. The Groffs suggest that some unusual states of mind are not diseases, they are actually crises of personal transformation. They are spiritual emergencies that have a positive potential. These are states that are well known in the shamanic and meditative and mystical literature of all traditions, which all validate the transformative potentials of these states if they're treated and responded to properly. Graf used the term spiritual emergency to differentiate visionary experience from psychosis. So a spiritual emergency is a non-ordinary state of consciousness, an emotionally powerful experience of connection to the spiritual dimension, and a visionary experience of a religious type that when it's misunderstood is diagnosed as delusional or hallucinatory. It's actually a spiritual awakening that has the potential to produce profound psychological transformation and an initiation into a higher level of consciousness. And the Groffs point out again that the whole picture resolves if the person is supported and may lead to improved well being and spiritual development. Jung, uh, in his text, says that a lot of treatment failure is due to the negative interpersonal milieu in which hospitalized patients live. So his approach was very radically different than standard psychiatric approaches, which don't take the individual's concerns seriously because they don't seem to be rational. They're seen as nothing but pathology. And what that does is it fixes, fixates the person in a state of arrested development. The individual feels isolated, not understood, and desperately needs an empathic listener. But if the individual senses that the therapist or the doctor only wants to prescribe and not listen, the patient becomes silent and withdraws and feels that it's hopeless to make himself understood. But actually, an understanding listener is very important for recovery. And some of the features of psychosis, like the severe withdrawal, are actually the result of unempathic surroundings when the person's experiences are being discounted. So the person feels it's hopeless. I won't be understood. It's not worth trying. But if the person is responded to with empathy and understanding, then the psyche gets on with its self-healing process. So the observer's problem, the therapist's problem, is to discern the emotional truth of the person's experience and find a way of allowing the person to convey his or her experience to the therapist. And this approach is consistent with all the psychotherapy research showing that non-specific factors like the relationship, the therapist's empathy and genuineness and so on, are much more important than the therapist's theoretical approach. Now, part of the evidence for Jung's idea that psychosis is an attempt at restitution and compensation is, is the well-known observation that some people emerge from a psychotic process better than they were before with an improved capacity for relationship. This is really an old idea. Anton Boysen noticed in the 1920s that 10% of cases of acute schizophrenia recover spontaneously. And there are other uh, studies showing a 30% spontaneous recovery rate. There's a, an English book by Richard Bentall titled, titled Doctoring the Mind, which said that 50% of psychotic people would be better off without drugs. But unfortunately, about a third of people with this problem at the moment remain chronically ill. 
Now, it seems that most psychotic processes occur at a time when the individual has reached a developmental impasse. They can't go any further. They're trying to separate from parents. They have intractable difficulties with relationship or some kind of crisis like that. And they develop very severe anxiety. They feel powerless, insignificant, unloved, and unlovable. And they feel terrified because they're so alone. And in that state of terror, they try to find relief by finding answers in the environment, for example, or by embracing some kind of delusional insight uh, that tries to explain the situation. These might be people who are predisposed to react to emotional crises with a kind of biochemical storm. And in fact, Jung thought that's very severe emotional stress leads to the development of an endogenous toxin that he called toxin X. But I'm not going to go into that biological uh, slant of that work. I just want to talk about the psychological sequelae. The, the psychotic person's imagery, as I said, is a metaphorical expression of an extreme emotional state expressed in the imagery of myth. Now, the most important Jungian writer in this area is John Perry. And here I have to mention the fact that Perry was expelled from the San Francisco Jung Institute and lost his medical license because of sexual boundary violations with female patients. He was expelled from the Institute in, in uh, he was suspended in 1981 and expelled in, in 1992 and he's lost his license and so on. So of course we, we condemn this kind of abusive behavior but I think we can recognize his personal failings and also examine his contribution to the understanding and treatment of psychosis, which I think was considerable. So there really were two parts to him, and I just want to focus on this, his therapeutic contrib contribution. So following Jung, Perry found that during a psychotic process, the psyche is trying to reintegrate and reorganize the personality, even though it seems chaotic. It's an attempt at renewal. Psychosis is seen as the, psych the psyche's way of dissolving the old way of being, starting again, renewing the self. Now, what Perry recognized were that there were these mythic and ritual themes in psychotic material. He recognized that the psychotic person is plunged into these deep levels of the psyche in which the imagery of myth overwhelms consciousness. And that's why in states like psychotic states, we see mythic themes, the conflict between good and evil, God and the devil, Armageddon is coming, the last judgment, the afterlife, the, the, the triumph of the Antichrist becoming a messiah, the cosmic order, becoming a god, death and rebirth, sacred marriage to a god or goddess, becoming a divine king or queen, um, the new Jerusalem is at hand, the, the, uh, I'm the child of royal or divine parents, and so on and so on. This is all the imagery of mythological stories. But that's the level of the psyche that becomes prominent in these states of mind. The experience of becoming very special, very important, a god or a world leader, is an identification with what Jung calls the self, the self written with a capital letter S. The idea is that there is a god within, um, the central organizing principle of the psyche, and sometimes the person identifies with that and feels that he or she is a god or goddess. And his idea was that the experience of being very special or chosen compensates for a one-sided conscious, uh, conscious idea that one is inferior or inadequate. So rather than feel that, what, uh, the individual identifies with one of these mythic figures becoming the second coming of Christ or the Blessed Virgin Mary, or the, the person can feel I'm a witch or a devil or something like that. Or sometimes these mythic figures can be projected out to the environment. And so the person feels threatened by demonic forces or and being followed by the FBI or the CIA, that kind of thing. That's the projection of this mythic imagery onto the environment. 
<clears throat> another theme that's fundamental to this reorganization process is the theme of return to the origins of the universe. Um, people talk about the conflict of God and the devil, which are, of course, um, ways of talking about the need to integrate different aspects of the personality. So we see death and resurrection themes, images of nuclear catastrophe, which represent the subjective experience of fragmentation and the need for reorganization. So again, from this point of view, when you give medication, you prevent the psyche from undergoing this attempt at self-healing. You, you prevent the attempt to dismantle the previous personality in order to reorganize it. So the individual is seeing life from a mythic perspective rather than an everyday ego perspective, the level of dreams, except that the subject is awake, but has been plunged into the same depths as the dream. So consciousness is overwhelmed by the depth and the subject is living in a mythic world. And the people around the person do not understand this realm. And so the person panics and feels isolated and withdrawn. <clears throat> and the, person, the person's inner world is, is far more emotionally charged than the outer world seems to be. So the person is drawn inward to, to focus on this internal mythic imagery. So the therapeutic problem is to understand this primordial imagery expressed as mythic imagery so it's not just that the person regresses to infantile levels they, they go back to this deep archaic level of consciousness um so um the, we see archetypal imagery like gods and goddesses wicked witches or the blessed virgin mary depending on the person the individual's personal psychology for example depending on their experience of their personal mother they they will experience the the goddess as a wicked witch or a madonna or something like that in other words the experience of personal mother material is colored by this kind of archetypal projection so um, one common mythic theme seen in schizophrenia is to, for people to believe that they have a messianic calling, that they're specially chosen by God to save the world or re reform society. This is partially a compensation for feeling weak and insignificant or the subject of injustice. It's partly an identification with the mythic image of the hero. In all mythologies, there are hero figures who follow a similar heroic pattern. The hero call to adventure. They have a dangerous night sea journey in which they, they face dangers, they fight dragons and so on. And in hero mythology, like the story of Moses, for example, there's often a, a mythic image of a, of a royal birth or sometimes um, the mythic image of a virgin mother, the risk of death in infancy, followed by being reared by foster parents, like in the stories of Moses and Oedipus. These are common themes in all hero myths. And this is the kind of mythic imagery that often arises in, in psychosis. If you're not familiar with this kind of mythic imagery, you, you, if you're a therapist, you see it as purely irrational or as primary process material, and you don't take it seriously, and that isolates the individual. And the therapist doesn't realize that the person is trying to express his emotional life in terms of mythic imagery, like I, I'm in heaven or hell or in the Garden of Eden. Perry also found similarity between the, the content of psychotic processes and imagery from the archaic religions of remote Bronze Age antiquity, themes that emerged with the rise of the sacral kingships in the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean, beginning about 3500 BCE in Sumer, which is now southern Iraq. These are themes that are found in the Bible and the Psalms. But in ancient Sumer, in, there was an annual New Year festival for renewal of the year and the kingdom. It was a ritual drama in which the culture's myth was acted out. The king was placed at, 
a, a kind of a mythic world center where the upper world and the lower world and the human worlds meet. And there he would struggle with the powers of darkness. And there was a symbolic return to the creative, the creation of the world with ritual combat between the powers of good and evil, with a sacred marriage with a goddess or a high priestess. And this led to, to renewal of the life and fertility of the kingdom. You find it in the Bible in the New Year festival in early Israel, when King David was the king of Israel. That's an example. This kind of imagery is found all over the Psalms. It includes images of enthronement, renewal of the covenant with God, conflict with the powers of evil, and so on. And Perry found parallels with this kind of myth mythic and ritual theme, ritual enactments, and the subjective imagery of schizophrenia, which he also thought was a kind of process of renewal and reconstitution. He thought that the original problem was that the ego suffers from a kind of constricted consciousness and nature's answer is psychosis as a form of dismantling and reorganizing the personality. So if your image of yourself is limited or devalued or unloved or faulty in some way, it's reorganized by psychosis in a way that um, ex compensates for the self-image. So to compensate for a very negative self-image, you have the delusion that you've been specially elected for an important role. You become a king or a queen or a leader. But if you become a king or a queen or a leader to compensate for inadequacy, you also become paranoid because then you are fated to be threatened by the powers of darkness in the cosmic struggle of good and evil. And there are many, many examples of these kinds of experiences. So I'll give you an example of one of Perry's cases of a young, a psychotic young woman who had an alcoholic father to whom she was very close and a paranoid, critical, devaluing mother who hated her, who envied her, and resented her closeness to her father. So she grew up with a very low self-esteem and a great deal of shame. She craved acceptance, but felt there was something deeply wrong with her, and she could never be loved. So she became psychotic, and there's a tremendous range of mythic themes. She said, a cosmic struggle is going on. The devil is hatching a plot to destroy the world. Opposing him was Christ, who's struggling with him to save the world. The world is divided into two camps, the devil and Christ's side. Um, and there were two sides of her own nature, masculine and feminine, both in conflict. And God and the devil were speaking into her ear constantly. And God's voice was hilariously funny and cracking jokes. But the Pope was possessed by the devil, just as the patient was. And he, the devil was in hell and she was in hell. And the devil's hat, the threefold tiara, was torn into little triangular bits of paper, which were scattered about the earth. And the Holy Trinity was separated and on earth in the same way. So work had to be done to reunite the Pope's hat and the Trinity. She said she was in hell um, and around her were people wearing masks of animals' heads. And she had to tr crawl through a skeleton from bottom to top and come out of the mouth. But the devil was in her bones and her hands had become claws and she had to repeat creation from the beginning. She had to go back to the beginning of the world. You can hear this mythic imagery. Um, she was under the water for a long time in the presence of great primordial monsters. Um, she had to return to her own beginning, her own birth and repeat her childhood and grow up to her present age go back to the beginning and start over again without any mistakes being made. But meanwhile, she was in the middle of this conflict between Christ and the devil, and a divine child had been born, and she had given birth to this baby because she had had intercourse with God every night in the form of her father. 
and this made her a new kind of virgin mother, and so on and so on. So this kind of imagery went on and on and on, and it's very typical mythic imagery. It makes no sense from the point of view of ordinary, consensual reality, but it makes perfect sense if you know mythology and religious imagery. That's the material which has overwhelmed this person. You can hear this theme of disintegration, reintegration. The conflict between the devil and Christ is a typical mythic theme of world destruction and reconstitution or death and rebirth. The devil represents chaos. Christ is the archetypal principle of order. So this is the mythic theme of the cosmic battle of good and evil that we see in many myths. And the dismantling of the Pope's tiara represented the dismantling of her Christian worldview. The descent into hell is a mythic theme. So is regression to the moment of creation, symbolizing the need for the development of a new life. And she gives birth to a divine child. The divine child or the child god, which is seen in many mythological systems, of course, is a symbol of the emerging new personality, which is trying to grow and develop. In, in all myths, the divine child has a miraculous birth and is abandoned or orphaned, but then has extraordinary powers. So, so um, her imagery of becoming one with the Blessed Virgin Mary and having a sacred marriage of God is typical symbolic mythic material um, expressing the, the, the need for renewal and rebirth to start again. Um, so her delusions show a kind of fantastic level of, inf of inflation by this archetypal material. She wants to be born again from the archetypal divine parents to the moment of creation. Now, if you understand mythic imagery, this old ancient religious imagery from a range of mythological and religious systems, you can understand what she's trying to convey. If you don't understand mythological imagery coming from this deep level of the psyche, her, her material makes no sense at all, but it makes perfect sense if you understand mythic material. So if you think that this is just a brain disorder, then, then you nullify the work of self-healing that the, the psyche is trying to do. The person feels alienated. They feel threatened as if they're dangerous to be around. They are, the person is made to conform to consensual reality they're not really able to convey to people around them what their subjectivity feels like. In fact, the psyche is trying to work out its own problems in this kind of non-rational mythic way. And if you're a therapist, you have to kind of follow this imagery. You have to try to understand this imagery. You have to listen quietly let go of the need for the person to behave the way we behave because the person is immersed in a very different mythic world than the world that we live in here and now a world of saviors and heroes and death and rebirth and gods and goddesses and good and evil and the clash of cosmic powers the person is much too preoccupied with the inner world to pay much attention to outer relationships. Now, Jung denied that the psyche can be reduced to brain functioning. He says that, that this is a quote from him, the dogma that mental diseases are diseases of the brain is a hangover from the materialism of the 1870s. It has become a prejudice that hinders all progress with nothing to justify it. So in other words, the psyche, the mind, consciousness is not generated by the brain. That's a materialistic illusion. The psyche is a domain in its own right. And a very important component of Jung's thought is that the psyche is real. So that from the person's subjective point of view, these experiences are very real and they have to be taken very seriously. Now, if I have a little more time, I'd like to say a bit about visionary experiences and, and psychosis. 
in our society, experiences of visions and voices or communicating with a figure like Jesus or the Blessed Virgin Mary are often considered to be symptoms of mental illness. But there are important differences between the phenomenology of mystical experience, true mystical experience, and psychosis. But there are also similarities. The usual description is that the mystic is a person who can swim in the same waters that the psychotic person is drowning in. Many normal people have experienced a visual or auditory voice or vision or a voice a, like a voice that gives advice or and comfort. These are quite common experiences. They're particularly common after bereavement when the person will have a, a visual experience of the dead person. They, they occur during highly stressful traumas, uh, war situations, after prolonged sleep deprivation, sometimes during solitary confinement, people have these kind of visionary experiences or sometimes they occur during intense meditation practices. They're not psychotic. They are, they are the result of contact with this deep level of the psyche. And people with a reasonably intact personality will have a brief experience like that, and then they will be able to come back to consensual ordinary reality. The difficulty with people who become permanently psychotic is they can't come back, but they go down to this deep level and, and stay there. Now, it's not always easy um, to know whether a, a belief that someone has is delusional. You, you have to take into account whether the person is behaving normally in consensual reality, whether they have deterioration of social skills, deterioration of self-care, deterioration of the thought process, whether they can regulate themselves, whether they can integrate the experience and so on. But there are many what are called anomalous experiences, like visionary experiences, near-death experiences, um, and so on, which are ignored or dismissed by mainstream psychiatry and psychology, which are not associated with psych psychopathology. That's a very important to understand. And they often produce positive life changes. That many people have these brief mystical experiences through contact with the archetypal level of the psyche, and they do not remain permanently psychotic. And these are not psychotic experiences. They are mystical experiences. Um, there are societies that invest these non-ordinary states of consciousness with meaning. They support the, the individual. They understand that the individual is undergoing a shamanic initiatory crisis, not a mental illness. Sometimes visionary important experiences can lead a person to urge changes for an entire culture, especially when the culture is going through a rapid change. I'll just give one example of that. In, in 1799, after years and years of very heavy alcohol excess, the Iroquois Indian leader, Handsome Lake, had a series of visions that cured him of his alcoholism, and he transmitted a moral code to his people that became a successful religious system, combining traditional, Iro traditional Iroquois beliefs with Christianity. And his code played an important role in the preservation of the Iroquois culture in the 19th century, and his work is still valued. Now, let me end with a, a comment about the, um, the sense of, of annihilation that people feel when they're undergoing a, a psychotic experience. This is why they're hard to understand. People suffering from psychosis often feel annihilated they may feel they don't exist. They are in a kind of state of non-being. Th this is what it's important to understand, to be with a person in this state. The person's mind and body feel as if they're being controlled or they don't belong to the person. So when you talk to such a person and you unthinkingly use a word like you, you immediately open up a gulf of misunderstanding and invalidation because there is no you. 
they feel like they don't exist so they so what when you say you they don't un, you, it's obvious to them that you don't understand what they're going through addressing them as if they exist makes communication impossible and reinforces their sense of not being understandable and so they react to that misunderstanding by withdrawal and then that withdrawal is said to be part of the illness but the person is living in a different world than the therapist very often in childhood this person was taken over by caregivers the parental agenda overpowered the child's personal development and overpowered the child's identity and didn't allow independence only what the parents needed the child to be was allowed so the child is completely regulated by outside forces so later on when they become psychotic and the fragile personality falls apart this delusion of control like by an influencing machine becomes the concrete expression of that early experience of being completely at the mercy of the parental agenda in other words the idea that these states of mind are just the result of genes or disordered brain chemistry is a radical overstatement you cannot uh, a very complex family situation cannot be oversimplified by reducing the problem to a genetic or biochemical problem and treatment based on a purely biological model is demoralizing and often unhelpful and destructive and really misses the point of what's happened to the person the the psychiatric profession and many psychologists have been socialized to think it in a biological kind of way instead of treating people psychotherapeutically but biological treatments are pessimistic and obviously as this society well knows we need a much more humane approach and i hope that today i've tried to show that jung's approach shows a possible direction so i think i'll stop now and we can have a conversation about this thank you for your attention I'm seeing a lot of hands, but I, Hi. I don't, uh, oh. sorry, Denise, go on. Yeah. Hi, um, I work um, as a substance abuse counselor as well as a mental health therapist, so I see a lot of um, co-occurring issues. My mm -hmm. question for you is, how do you think Young would conceptualize substance-induced psychosis? Um, well, his his general theory of, of alcoholism, for example, was that it, it was... Um, uh, and a kind of um, an attempt to concretize spirituality, an attempt, as it were, to put the spirit in a bottle. And um, that what was needed for the treatment of, of, of an addiction was a, of a powerful spiritual experience so that the person could, could experience spirituality uh, not in this concretized physical form of alcohol or of substance or something like that um and i think he would just see that alcohol induced psychosis is just one one entry into the kind of state of mind that i've talked about so you would have that combination of problems the the, the search for a kind of spirituality concretized in the form of an addiction um, and then taking the person into this mythic mental state i hope that addresses your question a little bit so we have we have a couple online questions can everybody hear me now okay all right so one of the questions dr corbett is um how can a parent help if they were too regulating if they were too regular at what stage are you talking about you, you mean when the person grows up or when i still a, when the person is still a child or i'm not sure i understand the question okay. let's see 
Maybe the questioner could ask the question. I don't know. Let's see. Let's let me let me see if she has more more questions here. How, okay, she has um, a different one. How possible is it for the therapist to receive help to assess spiritual warfare? How possible is it for the therapist to receive help to assess? Do you mean if the, I, I'm not sure I understand? Is, is the spiritual warfare going on as part of the mental state? She's saying after the psychosis. Oh, after. Um, I, I don't think I really understand the question. When the psychosis gets better and the person is still suffering from like the conflict of good and evil, is that? Could the questioner just clarify this a bit? Yeah. I don't think I understand the question. Can you clarify, please? Okay, we'll come back to that one. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question, but if you could just clarify the question a bit. So, another question is, was Jung an idealist, metaphysically speaking? Yes, he was an he was a, a monistic idealist. He believed that um, that um, well, the general principle of well, he believed that mind and matter, or psyche and matter, are two aspects of the same reality. But the psyche is the primary reality. The idealist philosophy says that we can't be sure that there's a material reality outside the mind because our only experience of the physical world is through the mind. Um, so, um, so what we call physical reality might simply be sort of the activity of consciousness. And he thought that that psyche and matter were really two aspects of the, uh, two sides of the same coin. Okay, we have a question from the audience. Um, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, I have a question. You said that um, the mind in its attempt at self-healing under psychotic processes, um, the, off many times the only way it can heal itself is through this mythic material. What, uh, my question is like, why do you think it can only only through the mythic material is that it can yeah. change uh, well, its processes? I, I, I don't know if I use the word only, but if I did, that was a mistake. I I, I shouldn't have said that. Well, uh, yeah, but I don't think it's the only way. It's a way. It's it's one way. I'm trying to. It's a way of understanding the kind of imagery that we see when people are psychotic. All this cosmic imagery, and you know. Um, it's just a way of approaching that as mythic material. There may be other routes to self-healing. I didn't mean to say it was the only way. So I didn't mean to give that impression. It's just that the, if you know mythology and religious systems and ancient ritual material, um, which you can find in Perry's books, um, and again, I, I, I'm aware of the... Um, unethical behavior of Perry, but I don't think it invalidates his clinical work. Um, if you're aware of that material, then then the person's material starts to make sense. It's not meaningless. It's not the result, just the result of a disordered brain chemistry. It's more complicated than that. Okay, we're going to go to online question and then in person. So because yeah. we have a lot of people, we're going to alternate. Mm -hmm. um, online will the mythic and religious symbols in psychosis be different for those across different cultures such yes. as race and ethnicity yeah um every culture has its own mythology but that's i should qualify that by saying that it doesn't matter what your own what what the culture that you grew up in is um that archaic mythic level of the psyche is common to all human beings so you can get mythic imagery from any culture you can be born in north america and get imagery from india or china or egypt or some other culture which is not the one you grew up in because that's why jung calls this the collective unconscious all human beings participate in this level um and so any of us, you can have a dream. Let's say you were brought up in, in a Christian society in North America. 
you, you can have a dream in which you have a Hindu god or goddess or an Egyptian, ancient Egyptian god or goddess appears in your dream, not the culture you grew up in, because we all participate in this deep archaic mytho, what's called the mythopoetic level of the psyche. So that's why you get this very bizarre imagery in dreams sometimes that doesn't make any sense. But it's also true that cu cultures have their own m mythic material. Um, but um, we we have to understand other people's mythology to understand their, their, their subjectivity. Okay, so we're going to go to the audience. One speaker. Okay. Do you right. have a question? Hi, Dr. Corbett. Um, yeah. I was at Soteria House, and then I left Soteria to help start Diabasis, so I knew mm -hmm. John and Lauren all those guys. Oh, yes, great, yes. Um, I want to thank you. It was a wonderful lecture. Um, I've kind of been a self-taught Jungian for the last 50 or 60 years. Um, but what, what I've, I've found essential is everything that you're saying is, is that we, you not interpret everything to the person you're, with, you're working with that allow them to de develop it let it come out the the understanding of it the union yes. understanding of, of the symbolism is for your security that's right it's for your um comfort yes. in being with them uh I, I found over and over again that they did not unless they asked actually for an interpretation what is going on with me yeah and very specific um I simply would not address that, but yeah. it was back of my mind, keeping me comfortable, keeping me yes. at ease, yes. allowing me to literally be with them yeah. in their chaos without me feeling that chaos. And so I think that's part of what's essential for any clinician, therapist, uh, if to be with someone is to understand that it's for your comfort. Yeah, thank you. Knowledge of Jung yeah. and, and, and don't, and don't right. tell them what it means unless they really seriously ask you. Yeah, thank you. I should have said that. I, di I didn't mean that this material is used, you're quite right, as an interpretation. It's a way of uh, for the therapist to understand what's going on so the person feels understood. That's the critical factor. And you, you can empathically, if someone says there's a nuclear war going on and the world is falling apart, if you understand that to me, to mean the, this person feels like he's he's fragmenting, he's falling apart, that helps you to stay there and be with them and say something empathically. So you're right, you don't need to interpret it. You, you just need to use it to understand it in a way that allows you to empathically sit with the person. It's the under, you're quite right, thank you for saying that. The understanding is the main thing. It's terrible not to be understood. Okay, we're going to go online for the next question. It's the clarification from the previous question. I believe this may be apparent. If a parent has an 18 year old, say, or a transitional age youth going through psychosis, how can a parent help? Um, by understanding, by trying to be empathic, by, but I, I don't know how, how else they can help. Um, I don't, it doesn't matter whether the person is a parent or a therapist, the process that I try to talk about is the same, just try to understand what's going on, don't be critical, just um, be attuned to the person's inner world. I don't know any other way of doing it, I don't, you know, I think it would be the same for a parent or a therapist. The, the difficulty is that, you know, People um, who are getting better, sometimes when they go back home, they, if the parents are the same as they've always been, the person is plunged back into the same family dynamic, they often relapse. So it's, it's, that, that's one of the problems with working with the families of people with this difficulty. You, you have to change the whole family dynamic, and that's very difficult. All right, we have a question here up front that got intercepted. Hi, um, I guess my question has to do a bit with the interpretation that you were talking about. Um, you mentioned the person with psychosis potentially interpreting themselves as not being real and the meanings behind that. But I'm mm -hmm. wondering what you think the meaning is behind 
say I am a person with psychosis and my interpretation of the world is that I'm the only thing that's real and everything else around me is some sort of simulation or not real. Yeah. So yeah. what could interpretations of that be? Yes, a feeling of un the, that the world is unreal, a feeling of unreality is very common in these states of mind. Um, it's probably the result of having had the perception of the world discounted. You know, there, there are families in which the child's perception of reality is discounted and the parent's perception of, uh, of the way things are uh, is superimposed on the child's perception. So the child can't trust his own perception of reality and then everything feels unreal. So I think one just has to understand that that's been the developmental process that's happened to the individual. And then you have to start reaffirming the validity of their own perceptions, because that's been discounted and denied by the family. I'm, I'm taking up a particular theory here about the, the origins of schizophrenia, obviously, which most people in the mainstream of psychology and psychotherapy today would not agree with because they call it, they call it parent blaming. Um, and there's a great deal of criticism of this kind of approach, but that's, you know, that's just the situation at the moment. They, they, they want to make it a purely a metabolic brain disease. Okay, we'll go online for the next question. Yeah. What if a person, what if someone has been in a psychotic state for many years and the process has been aborted with medications? Mm -hmm. And the person goes in and out of the hospitals and becomes alienated from their family, and he is deteriorating more and more. Can this person still be helped to finish the process? While yes, I think if the if the medication could be reduced to the lowest level possible, I think it's still possible to 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 work with the person psychotherapeutically. There are people who need very low levels of medication because that what antipsychotic drugs are useful for is reducing terror. Psychotic states are terrifying. An antipsychotic medication can help with with extreme terror, but obviously it has to be used in the lowest possible levels, I think. But I, I would say yes, they can still be helped. I really recommend George Atwood's book, The Abyss of Madness, for the, the most up-to-date uh, information about how to work with people in these states of mind. Okay, we have a question from the floor. Thank you so much for your lecture. My, my question is about uh, when you spoke about visionary and auditorial experiences, you explained them as mystic and um, psychotic, that people can swim or get stuck in those arenas. My mm -hmm. question is, is there alternative options such as external stimulation that's creating those, those auditorial and hallucinations, not something internally? I don't quite understand. Are you asking if someone is, say, is hearing voices or something like that, is that coming from the outside or? Yes, is that is there an option? Because what it sounded like is the auditorial and visionary experiences are within. Yeah. But is there an option? And it sounded like it was either that it was black oh. and white. It's only within. Oh no, I, 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 I sorry, I just option. understood you. I'm sorry. Yes. Um, you see, if you if you believe, it very much depends on your metaphysical commitments. If you believe there's a spiritual dimension of reality, that there are spiritual entities or forces or processes then you might believe that they can communicate with you and then the voice that you're hearing might might be a spiritual voice you know like the still small voice that the bible describes you know when elijah was hiding in a cave i mean um if your metaphysics allow that the voice of god can come to you then it seems to be coming from the outside so it depends whether you whether you believe that there is a spiritual dimension. If you don't, then you have to say it's an it's something generated by the brain that's projected as if it's coming from the outside. So, so the the answer to that depends on your metaphysical beliefs. 
Okay, one more for the floor over here. Yeah, um, so we were talk. you were talking about sort of the collective unconscious and the personal unconscious. Mm -hmm. Did Jung talk at all about the possibility that a trauma or an injury could happen at the level of the collective unconscious? I I'm thinking about things like world wars. Yes, definitely. Where there's actually an yeah. injury at that level that's actually oh. also part of driving the system along. Yeah, the the phenomena like the Nazi phenomena or fascism in general, these are... These are a collective pardon me these are collective phenomena then something like the nazi phenomena from jung's point of view is a real is a spiritual phenomenon because he believed that the spirit has a light side and a dark side the light side is is good and benevolent and loving and so on but it but the dark side of the spirit is destructive and manifests itself in phenomena like fascism so that's a very controversial point of view but that was his point so, so this deep level of the psyche has its dangerous aspects as well. Okay, one more for the floor, and then I have to go online again. Hi. Um, so uh, from the perspective of more conventional clinicians, uh, one of the arguments I've heard the most often for uh, really strongly using any psychotics to stop a an episode of psychosis is that uh, someone having one episode of psychosis is more likely to uh, essentially have uh, like patterns recurring and that allowing the episode to finish is going to create that particularly in what I'm interested in is like manic psychosis. I'm wondering if you could comment on that and how that relates to the sense of psychosis needing to complete something. Yeah, I, I think, um, well, um, 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 mania does tend to recur, but what I was talking about was more like schizophrenic phenomenology, not manic. That there are psychodynamic explanations for manic phenomena, uh, like, um, well, it's a long story. The work of Bernard Branshaft has, there, there have been psychoanalysts who've understood mania from a psychoanalytic point of view. But I wasn't talking about manic phenomenology. I was talking more about schizophrenic phenomenology. Um, so, I, I, so it, it is true that mania can can be a recurrent problem. Um, I don't know if mania can be approached in the way that I've been talking. I think it's a different problem altogether. Okay, so now we go to online. I was fortunate to have a Jungian therapist when I was in college and hearing distressing voices. Do you mm -hmm. know of any efforts to influence college mental health clinics to adopt this type of approach? No. I don't, I don't either. Uh, no, because, because the mainstream psychotherapy training doesn't pay any attention to this kind of approach. It's, it's, it's a, um, <clears throat> it's a, you know, it teaches that these are metabolic brain disorders so that's what therapists in trainings are, are taught and um, they have no access to this kind of material that's why an institution like your isps is an important group maybe you can influence the training of psychotherapists eventually please god let me know if i can help in that 